Um, hi, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here. My name is Peter. I'm actually really excited to be here at all uh, because I, I was supposed to be here on, on Thursday like evening, but I arrived last night at 8. Um, so like I arrived in, in Denver on Thursday, and then my fl uh, bus got canceled due to a snowstorm. Because like you, you can't just come to Colorado and not have a snowstorm and fuck up your trip. It's, like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's what you pay for in the flight. And I'm also still waiting for the, the bear mauling experience. But so anyway, so I, I slept in the train station, which if, if you were planning to sleep on the, in the train station, I, I don't recommend it. Um, but yeah, so I, then I took the train last uh, this morning, or last morning, sorry. Um, and then like all the things happened, like rocks on the, on the tr uh, railroad, and uh, there was a fist fight in the train, so someone had to like call an ambulance, and I guess one, one of them lost, one of them won. Um, but yeah, <laughs> uh, happy to be here. Okay, so this talk is about Clang and LLVM. It's a topic I find very exciting because I think it's, it's important for everyone. And to some extent, I liken it to uh, taking some of the power of the omnipotent compilers and giving it to the people, to the mortal developers. Um, because as you'll see, like Clang is actually really just a very, very awesome library that uh, you can use for like reflection on steroids. And reflection in the sense that it's, it's not reflection of your current program, but reflection of some other program. And you have the entire power of the compiler, which has a lot of power because it needs to actually compile your program. All right, so um, very quickly about me. And I wanted to keep the slide like, short, so I compressed my entire CV into one word. Um, so I'm, I'm a second year CS student uh, in Munich. And right now I'm at Facebook uh, doing an internship. I just started on Monday. Uh, before that, I was at an AI startup. Before that, at Bloomberg. Before that, at, at Google. And after that, I'll be at uh, MIT doing a like, uh, machine learning research internship. Uh, so my, my interests are generally like schizophrenic between C++ and machine learning. All right, um, so jumping right in. So this talk is about Clang, of course, but I nevertheless want to give a bit of a sweeping overview of LLVM because I think it's a very interesting project and because I think it's also good to know where Clang tooling fits into the entire compiler tool chain so we, we know where we're actually entering the pipeline. So LLVM is a tool chain for compiling. And once upon a time, it stood for low-level virtual machine. Uh, it doesn't anymore. Now it's just an umbrella term for a number of different tools and projects built on top of the LLVM stack. So you have the LLVB debugger. You have the opt optimizer, which is really the core of LLVM, uh, the uh, LLVM linker, and even LLJVM, which compiles C to Java bytecode. I know that, like, that th those people exist. Um, and then there's a bunch of programming languages, of course, built on top of LLVM. So you have Clang, which doesn't have its own logo, unfortunately. You have uh, Swift, which was also designed by the designer of LLVM, Chris Latner. Uh, he worked at Apple for like 10, 15 years. Now he works at Tesla uh, as the VP of autopilot software, working on uh, electric compilers. Um, and the funny thing is actually that Tesla uses GCC, <laughs> uh, so too bad for him. And then there's also Rust and even TensorFlow. So the uh, Google's machine learning library uses LLVM to compile computational graphs for machine learning to like fuse operations and just in time compile things even in a distributed like on, on very many nodes. So LLVM is really awesome. There's of course loads more projects and languages built on top of LLVM. Then I'd like to talk a little bit about compilers. So of course this is not supposed to be an intro to compilers, but I think it's nevertheless interesting to understand uh, what Clang actually is and what LLVM is and where we're uh, actually working. So in general, nowadays compilers have a three-phase design consisting of a front end of an optimizer and of a backend. So the front end is responsible for parsing, so tokenizing your code, lexical and semantic analysis, building an AC. The, op the optimizer will then take an intermediate representation of your code and perform lots of optimizations on it, hopefully, to make it faster and leaner. And then the backend is responsible for taking that intermediate representation and turning it into architecture or target-specific uh, machine code or ob object code. Then the Basic benefit or most important benefit of this three-phase design is that if you have these three separate parts, you can have many different front ends all using the same optimizer and back end, and you can have this you can have many different back ends all using the same optimizer, so intermediate representation. So this is actually really essential and crucial because if you didn't have this, just in this case you would have to have nine different compilers for just three languages and three backends. Whereas in this case you can add any backend for like some new microcontroller or like some new system you might be developing, which Actually, it turns out uh, most people using LLVM do. So you have lots of companies who develop like ASICs or special chips, and they use LLVM to like, compile stuff to these specific targets. And of course, you could have many different front ends for your own language, for new languages, and so on. Now, a little bit more about LLVM in this case. So in the case of Clang and LLVM, the front end is split up into the lexer and parser. At this point, we would be dealing with .c or .cpp or 
uh, .m, so Objective-C files as well, and we would be lexing it, turning it into an AST. Then the optimizer is really um, a set of passes, um, and at this point we would be dealing with .ll, which is the LLVM intermediate representation of files, and also .bc, which is a bit code representation. And this is actually really the core of LLVM and the core benefit. Uh, so GCC actually only got this very late, um, only in the past few years, this, this intermediate, intermediate representation, uh, because it, and it's really very important for all of LLVM. And so in case of, for example, the LLVM optimizer, you would have const prop pass, which would try to plop constants throughout your code. Uh, then uh, LICM, which is loop independent code motion, which tries to take declarations out of loop, so you don't do it in every single pass of the loop, like if you're declaring some constant. Then, of course, inlining and loop unrolling. So these would be passing through. I think there's like 60 to 100 passes running every single time you run Clang. And that, of course, is very important. And then the back end does machine-dependent optimization and will emit .o or .s files. Um, so machine-dependent optimization is basically the idea, or, or the goal here is to take the intermediate representation and map it as efficiently as possible to the target architecture. So for example, in the case of like uh, x86, a, a CISC architecture, where you have instructions for everything, like copying a register to another register and AES encrypting your hard disk and tweeting about it all in one instruction, uh, the goal here is really to take lots of instructions and, and mapping it to a single one on the target architecture. And then also doing things like register allocation, which is actually a very interesting and, and difficult problem, where um, uh, in a program you have lots of different values alive at different times, and you need to map them to registers. And in the case of x86, which has only very few registers, this is very hard. And then in the end you have the code generation, um, where you emit the actual uh, assembly code or object files, and then pass that onto the linker. And we'll be dealing mostly with the front end, of course, because that's what Clang is, Clang front end. Now, looking a bit more closely at Clang, uh, let's look at what the lexing and parsing steps would do in the case of Clang, because this is also where we'll be operating. This is our playground for today. So the lexer would, first of all, take this C++ code you just saw and uh, tokenize it. So split it up, and so take these raw characters and split it up into many different annotated tokens. So in this case here, we would have like keyword for template. We'd, we would have the, the less um, token, another keyword, identifiers, and so on. And so this is the output of the lexer. And at this point, um, I'd like to just jump into some code. And also one goal for the talk today is just to give you like a very sweeping overview of the Clang and LVM code base. So can people see this? All right, so this is, this is Clang. Um, it's actually a very, very nice and beautiful code base. So given the fact that it's almost 15 years old, it's probably one of the best maintained projects out there in the wild. Um, seriously, like probably top three or even the best one. Uh, it has very clean code. It's very well optimized. Uh, so how many people saw Chandler's talk on like LVM data structures a few years ago? Okay, so you, you'll probably, and I'll also talk a bit about that later. But so the, the only quirk is that um, variables are uppercase, or, or capitalized, sorry, which is a bit of a problem if your class has the same name as your variable. But other than that, it's, it's actually very nice code. So you can imagine for Elixir, this would uh, end up being just a very large switch case statement, and it really is, like this is all switch case. Um, and so for example, if we uh, were to read the R token, then if this is a C++11 compiler, R could mean raw spring literal. So we would try to like some more, like try to see if there's a, uh, this, this um, quote uh, symbol afterwards. And otherwise, if it's not C++11, it's just this, a normal identifier character. And then we have that for all other kinds of characters, of course. <laughs> okay, so after the lexing step, we have a stream of tokens. And then it's the job of the parser to take the stream of tokens and build an abstract syntax tree uh, out of it. So in this case, we would have this, this function declaration from the code you saw before. And we would have a CXX method decal in Clang terminology. And at this point, also remind yourself that Clang is not just a C++ compiler, but also a C and especially Objective-C compiler, which is probably the furthest from C++. So everything that's C++ related has a CXX in front of it. And you would have a method decal, then you would have, in this case, a return type, a parm var decal, and an isconst, where the isconst is of, because this is a member function. Then the parm var decal would have uh, a default argument, would have a qual type, an identifier, and the qual type would have a type inside, because a qual type just adds like const or volatile qualifications to a type. And then above that, you have a CXX record decal, and the record is a struct, class, or union. And then above that, the, the top level will, will always be the translation unit decal. And then you have lots, lots more uh, beneath that. And this is actually really nice because the Clang, Clang has a very rich AST, which you can access, which you can work with, and which you will like to work with later on. Now, uh, once we have this AST, the next step in the LVM uh, pipeline, and this is actually also where we'll stop, 
is taking this AC and transforming it into LLVM intermediate representation. So this would uh, basically have something walk the AST and for each node in the AST emit some LLVM. And this actually also, so this is if you were to uh, write your own front end, at this point you could stop because that's all you need to do. As soon as you have some way of transforming your quirky brain fuck language into LLVM intermediate representation, uh, you can use the entire power of LLVM. You can um, write that to any backend. You can use all the optimizations. And that's actually very powerful. Um, so at this case, in this point, for example, if you wanted to, is this lab? Let's go up a bit. Uh, let's, let me show you what uh, this intermediate presentation would look like. So I have this test file here, for example. It just has a function. And if I wanted to emit LLVM, I have this command here, uh, minus s and minus emit LLVM. And this will uh, emit this test.ll file. And we can see what this actually did. So in this case, this is very unoptimized. Um, if I actually turn it to like 03, uh, there, there would be literally nothing left because nothing is actually using this. And uh, you can also see that there was this class, which no one uses. Uh, so it's also gone. But um, what you can see here is that the LLVM intermediate representation is actually uh, a risk construction set on its own. So uh, it has some nice properties, like it's strongly typed. It has some higher level constructs like defining functions or calling functions or returning from functions because that's, that basically abstracts away the calling conventions that you would have on a normal architecture. And then you also have infinite registers. So this is also uh, the reason why it's a virtual machine and not a real machine. Um, you have infinite registers because that makes analysis a lot easier. So whenever you would like increment a variable like we did up here, like this plus equals one, that would actually store, for example, from two into a new variable uh, percent three because that makes it easier to understand what's going on. It's, it's basically like um, if you were to split up your program into lots of different uh, declarations and each one were const, it's of course easier to understand what, what each line does, uh, even though it's maybe a bit more verbose. Okay, then we, uh, let's talk a bit more about the Clang AST. So this is uh, what we'll be playing with today. Uh, so we have this statement here. And there's four major classes when we're uh, using Clang. The first one is uh, statements. So a statement is uh, a lot of things. So in this case, for example, we have an if statement, uh, which has a condition that it's checking and some code in between. And I'd like to also show maybe here some, some, some doxygen. So Clang doesn't have very, that much like inline documentation, but the doxygen is very nice. So you can see there, there's a few statements, a few different kinds of statements. Um, and a statement would have, for, for example, in this case, we have, have an if statement. And an if statement has something like a condition expression. It has a then statement, which is anything inside the, the after the if. It also has a corresponding else statement. And we can get uh, locations. And there's also this interesting uh, get in it. So does anyone have an idea why an if clause would need an initializer? Yeah, exactly. So like if we just pop up like this if statement here, and we can see that, for example, so if you've never seen this, uh, we could have some, some if statement here in C++17 uh, where we declare a variable and then have a like, semicolon and then actually check some condition after the if clause. So this is actually a very nice new feature uh, that I encourage you to use uh, with Clang, of course. And yeah, so that's, that's what you would be dealing with. And uh, there's, of course, lots and lots more beneath this AST. Then, after statements, we have declarations. So declarations could be anything from a class declaration, variable declaration, function declaration. And also, if we, if we go to the doxygen for deco, uh, it's, it's even, <laughs> even larger. So there's really loads of different declarations. Um, anything from like declaring an enum, I think, is somewhere here. The name declarations, which would be like classes. And then even here, there's, there's value declarations. And then if we're actually interested in like looking at the, uh, we have this open, in actual like fields or variables, there's even more behind this. So uh, LVM does use uh, inheritance and polymorphism a bit, and, and quite a, or actually quite a lot. So uh, you'll see this very much. And so for here, way down the inheritance chain, you would have a field declaration inside a class, or you would have a variable or a function. And that's what you would be working with. OK. Then after declarations, you have expressions. And this is actually a bit of a quirk inside the, or, of the Clang architecture that an expression actually derives from statements. So intuitively, this doesn't actually make sense because an expression is not a statement. You would think that a statement has an expression and is terminated by the semicolon. 
uh, but that's the case. So for example here, the condition would be an expression, and also the string literal would be an expression. Uh, but the fact that expression inherits from statement also means that you can't actually represent the uh, semicolon, like the no-op in, in, like, in Clang. Like there's no way to actually represent it, uh, which is a bit funny. Um, yeah. Just not get representing the ASP at all? No, because like you would basically, like if you had it with a, oh, it, sorry, the question was, it, does it not get represented in the ASP at all? Um, I believe it doesn't because it, like if you had the, the has a relationship, you could just say, say like a, a no-op would be a statement without an expression. But in this case, um, I'm not sure what it does, but I know that it, it can't be uh, represented very well inside the AAC. And the last thing then is types. So types are obviously important, especially in C++. Uh, in this case here, we have a const care pointer type declaration. Um, and then beyond types, you have qual type. So a qual type uh, contains a type inside and adds some qualifications. And we can actually look at this. It's, it's quite cool. So this is actually uh, more related to Chandler's talk uh, that I mentioned before. Um, so if we go to qual type, then this, is, this here is really the, like, this is the entire LVM philosophy that Chandler talked about in his talk in one class. So a qual type uh, basically has a pointer to a type. And this is also, if you remember, Chandler said that if you have big objects like types that you use everywhere in your program, then sometimes it's just a good idea to actually allocate them once and just have pointers to them. And that's what, what uh, LVM and Clang do. And then we add some more quirkiness. So first of all, if you just ignore this in, in between here, what this pointer int pair does is it uses the lower four bits of every pointer. If, so if, if you don't know, like malloc usually allocates in 16 byte boundary, so the lower four bits are up for grabs, and, and LVM does grab them. So here we have a pointer in pair. The pointer is to the type, and then we can use the lower four bits for const or non-const, volatile or non-volatile, and additional qualifications. So that already like, saves us some, some space. And then the next step is that if we needed more qualifi uh, qualifiers, then we have a pointer union, which would actually, instead of pointing to the type, would instead point to an external structure, which contains the type and more qualifiers. So like in 99.9% .9 of cases, you would just have this one pointer using the lower bits. But if you need more, then you can just, uh, the, then the same pointer will point somewhere else. And so that's actually really ma like maximally space efficient, which, which is very nice. <laughs> okay, um, now we get to clanging all the things, uh, talking a bit more about clang tooling. Uh, lip clang, uh, lip tooling, and then we can spend the rest of our time looking at some code. So the first thing we have in clang tooling is lip clang. So there's these two basic uh, libraries. There's lip clang, there's lip tooling. Lip clang is the C interface. And the one thing that's special about lip clang, apart from it being uh, in C, is that it's the stable API. So one of uh, Chris Latner, so the founder of LVM, and general like LVM community's uh, philosophy is just to break all the eggs. Um, so whenever something needs to be changed in the intermediate representation, just, just Break it, uh, break all, everything that depends on it because we need to move forward. And the re like that's good for the pro for the project, but it's bad for everyone depending on it. So for this case, if you're like developing um, an editor, for example, you don't want to like update your code uh, after every release. So libclang is the stable C interface. So libclang basically never changes. Uh, it probably was like designed once, uh, and it has a clean uh, interface that won't change very much in the next few years. So if you're writing an editor, you can use libclang. And, and rely on it not changing that much. So here's some libclang code, and we'll walk through some real code after, but just to give you an idea, uh, libclang has this basic concept of cursors. A cursor is just like a pointer to a node. And then uh, we have visitation. So one thing I forgot to mention about these different like expra and dictal and type nodes is that there is no common AST node in Clang. So there's no like base class for all kinds of nodes. And the main implication of this is that whenever we want to walk the AST, we're never going to be able to just like have a function like this here in C, where we have a cursor, where we can take any kind of node. So anytime we want to walk the AST in the C++ API, we're going to be using, be using visitation. So we'll have like a class that we override, and then we override the visit decal, visit type, visit statement uh, functions. And that's actually a very important uh, part of Clang as well. But so in this case, we would have a cursor, uh, which is just a pointer to a node. We would be getting its location, checking if it's the main file or not from system header. And then we would getting, be getting its spelling, uh, print it, and then in proper RAII fashion, disposing it. And then this line down here just tells it to recurse. And we would be giving this to some uh, low-level C API, and it would do most of the magic for us. Another thing that's cool about libclang is that it has built-in code completion. 
And that's actually very important because literally if you want to like get co code completion um, for your code, there's one function called code complete at, which you pass a buffer and pass a location, and it will tell you all the possible completions at that point. So what, what Clang does here is that when, when you tell it to code complete at, it will insert a special marker in the AST, and then when it parses um, and reaches that specific point, it will use all the context it has, all the like you know, everything it knows about the AST at that point to give you full information about how you could complete the code at that point. Uh, so there's those functions and a few more like very nice high-level functions. And also what's nice about libclang, or maybe nice, is that it has a Python API. So this is the exact same code in Python. You know, not, not saying anything, not saying that one is better. Um, but this one is, is quite readable. It's also like it's even more high-level. And this is, this is probably useful because lots of editors, like I think Sublime uses Python. And, and Adam uses JavaScript, so having like scripting languages uh, on top of the C APIs is, is actually very useful. Then we have libtool. Sorry, yeah. So is there a C++ API on top of it? Also, so something that handles all the RAI iterators, ranges, or is that a roll it your up self? Um, so the question was if there's a C++ API. Uh, there is, uh, but not for libclang. So libclang is like the C API, and then there's the, the very powerful lip tooling library, which you use for everything else. Right? Yeah, and that's what you're looking at. Um, so lip tooling is the C++ uh, library. And one thing to know, note about lip clang is that because it's so stable, it's very high level as well. So be, even though it's, it's nice, and like if you can achieve something with lip clang, I would definitely try to achieve it with lip clang because it's less code, it's, it's uh, usually easier. But very often you'll just get stuck because there's something you want to do and lip clang doesn't expose it. And that's where you usually want to use libtooling. And I actually also prefer libtooling because it's C++ and, and it's a lot more powerful. So with libtooling, uh, and we're going to look at some code in a bit, but there's three basic kinds of doing tooling. Uh, the first thing is, is Clang Tidy. Uh, so how many people here know Clang Tidy? Yeah. So the first way of adding uh, or writing a Clang tool is to integrate directly with Clang Tidy. So here you would basically be adding a new plugin to Clang Tidy and be adding it to one of its checks. The nice thing about this is that it abstracts away a lot of the boilerplate, uh, but you're also bound to Clang Tidy, and you can't just have like an external tool. And then we have Clang plugins. So Clang plugins are uh, essentially the same as uh, the last one, which is Clang tools, except for the fact that uh, Clang plugins are dynamic libraries that you build and that you link into uh, Clang when you run it. And it's also a bit more complex to actually pass it to Clang. But the nice thing about like Clang plugins is that you could just for example, put it into your um, like build tool and would run checks when you compile and make sure that you're not like violating any, any like linter errors or anything. Um, but the last one is, is uh, writing a Clang tool, and this is actually what I prefer doing, which is really just writing a standalone executable using Clang as a library. And this is really cool because you, you get a standalone thing that you can drop into places, and you have all the power about the, like you actually have a main function. So in the case of Clang plugin, you don't have a main function, so you can't do uh, any, like, first of all, you, you can't keep states uh, in some cases, but you also can't do like um, emit some JSON at the end or something because you don't actually know when it ends. So, lip, so Clang tooling uh, gives you all the power. Uh, Clang tool gives you all the power. All right. Um, so this this picture should tell you that we're going to have some fun now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so <clears throat> I, I brought a lot of tools, and actually I brought too many tools. So. Um, because I had so much time on the train here, I, I decided to <laughs> make this slightly inter interactive. So I made this, I hope this loads. I made this, uh, this, this HTML17 uh, website <laughs> where you can actually like vote. You're, you're going to be voting now what tools you want to see. Um, so pr please bring out your phones and, and bring out your Wi-Fi. Um, I'm just going to walk, like briefly describe each one, and then you can, so th this HTML17 website has a REST API, of course. <laughs> And then you can vote for it. But so let me just like walk through each one. So AST dump is the first one. Um, it's, it uses libclang, so the C library, and it just dumps the AST. So what it does actually is, if we have some code here, uh, yes. So if like there's there's this ast dump uh, thing you can do with Clang, which is actually very cool. Um, <clears throat> and it basically just dumps the AST with all the information about the types and uh, variable names and everything. And ASTUMP would be rewriting that in libclang, which is actually very educational because you need to, you'll see how we can access all of this information through libclang. So that's the first one. Um, the next one is CPP rep. 
So sometimes you might have this problem, like if you have an editor and you want to look for the word, I don't know, like class, it will be everywhere, right? Like you have a class keyword, you have class comment, and if you, if you have some variable named, I don't know, Phil, you might have a class named Phil and everything named Phil. So what CPP grep does is it's also using libclang. It, it's like grep, but you can actually like filter by functions, like C++ functions or C++ records uh, and so on. So it's, it's quite cool. Then dict check. Um, so a while ago, I was working on a like, program in university, and, and my, my fellow code of others um, weren't so fond of readable variable names. So I, because I was a team lead, like, I decided to write a tool that would run through their code and make sure that every variable is a word in the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> and so dict check does that. It's, it's actually very short and, and fun. Uh, include sorter is, you can imagine what it does. This is, uh, so dict check and include sorter. Uh, include sorter just sorts includes are both lib tooling. Um, then min minus tool is more of a like educational one uh, to show you how diagnostics work in Clang. So if you're interested in how diagnostics and fix sets work, that one's pretty cool. Then use override checks that you use override on your methods. So this is more into the region of like making sure that you as a developer like uh, write safe code. Uh, virtual destructor makes sure you use like virtual uh, if you ever derive from a class, even if you don't declare the constructor at all. And uh, using lib tooling and Clang variables is if you're interested in how to like do some extreme kind of matching. So you want to find, so Clang actually stands for const lambda that takes an auto variable is declared no except and has a go to inside. So if you want, if you're interested in like finding exactly some like particular node, uh, this, this tool is quite interesting. CPP grep pi is the same thing as CPP grep, but in Python and like half the amount of code. Um, enable if checks that you use enable if underscore T instead of type name enable if. So it's more like modernization, which is cool. Uh, Maccabi, this one is, is quite nice. Uh, it, have you ever heard of like Maccabi computational uh, cyclomatic complexity? So like this is basically it, it's a measure of how complex your code is, like how many paths there are through your code. It's actually very like interesting to know uh, because if you have lots of like if clauses in your code, um, you should probably refactor things or re rethink your design. So if you so this tool actually does that. It sounds very complex, but it's just like three lines. Uh, but it also shows you how to access the control flow graph in Clang. Then we have pointer finder, which finds pointers. Uh, so previously, I, I was at Bloomberg, and in Bloomberg, we have this, this, this style rule that every pointer has to be prefixed with p underscore. Uh, so this, this, this uh, tool finds all pointers, make sure they're prefixed. And then using versus type defs, finds all type defs, and recommends to use using statements instead. OK, so the way we're going to do this is, so this, I, I unfortunately did not have the time to register uh, a domain name. Um, but so if you like, can people see this? Um, yeah. Yeah, let me just. So this, if you, so this is the um, URL, and I'm gonna like put it. Let me just join these two here. Why, why is this Twitter? Okay, so if you follow that URL and then do a vote and then slash one two, like the these are the the bold like numbers here. Um, and if you type that, let me just show you. If you type that in here, uh, then it may explode. No, it does not explode. Uh, so it basically like thanks for voting. And then if I reload this page, I just voted. Right, um, so just do this. Um, like, just can anyone see see this this uh, IP address? And just a comma separated list of the numbers in bold, and that will make you vote. So we can vote early and often. Yeah, they, <laughs> don't 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 cheat. <laughs> don't vote and don't DDoS my server. <laughs> <On> my phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As I'm just. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'll just do that for like two minutes or something. In the meantime. Oh, well, it, it's loading very slowly. <laughs> I think it isn't that <laughs> Okay, in mean, worst case, I'm just going to pick some, like, pictorially, but I thought this would be fun. Oh, is, it, is it still running? <laughs> yeah, okay. It is still live, so if we, indeed, it, okay. So let's just wait, like, three more minutes. In the meantime, if you have any questions, I, I'm, Happy to answer. <coughs> okay. So I think people are. Does anyone need more time? Oh, wait, wait, wait. What, what, what's, the, what's the number? You you want the bold numbers. So the so the I made it so that they don't actually change. So that you don't have to like look where everything moved, even though the rank actually changes. So I think if, if this manages to load, then we'll just pick that. 
Oh. I should have shorted this probably a few more times. OK, OK, so let, let's just um, stop it here. Thanks for your vote. I hope democracy, like democracy is a nice thing, uh, as long as it doesn't get Trump as president. <coughs> Sorry? Yeah, it says like thanks for voting, and, and the tools that you pick. All right. Um, okay. So we have so CPP grab, um, Maccabi, um, include sorter, and so on. All right. So we'll just start with CPP grab. Um, yes, live, very live, so live. Okay. Um, CPP grab. Okay. So this was uh, libclang, as I said. Um, let's just start at the very bottom. It's, it's reasonably lots of code. Um, and I'll just walk, it th walk through it. Um, so libclang, first of all, uh, sorry, uh, LVM is a very nice command line library. Uh, it's actually like the nicest one I've seen so far. The only like, detriment is that it uh, uses global variables for everything. So if you're linking with some other library that also declares flags, you'll have those flags as well. Um, but nevertheless, so the first thing you always do with libclang is create an index. And an index is like a structure that will manage all your translation units for you. And then you can also use pre-compiled headers, which makes your code a lot faster, or your, your parsing a lot faster, of course, for, especially for like standard um, headers. And then, uh, so the, what this tool actually, what the, um, how you use it, let me just go here, CPP grep. So, so I can say at this point, I've spent a significant amount of my life trying to compile LVM and Clang. Like if you made a pie chart of my life, you, the slice would be visible. <laughs> so I've, I've now moved to just using uh, Docker uh, with like the LVM library uh, like installed via apt. So let's just, let just show you what this does. Um, so CPP grab, the way you will use it is um, like some pattern, for example, and then the file. And then it'll just show you like the lines and everything. And then you have like, you can filter by functions, you can filter by members, um, parameters, records, so classes or structs, variables, and you can make it in case insensitive. So that's what we're building. Um, nope. All right, so then for every uh, file, we're just gonna read the lines. We're gonna need those lines later on uh, because we want to find, like, write out the entire line where we found a match. Um, but that's just a detail. Then we have this parse function. And parse, what parse does is it calls clang parse translation unit. So this is a very important function because it actually like, gives you back the entire AST. So this does all the parsing. You pass it this index. You pass it a file name. And you can also pass it some buffers. So this is important if you like, actually have an editor and you have some un, like, unstored buffers. You can actually just pass the, those buffers to clang. It will also parse those for you. And then at the end, we have the CX translation unit, which is a cursor um, as well. And then once we have this uh, translation unit, we can uh, get a cursor, sorry, and then call clang visit children. And this is this important function, which I, I showed you before, which does the actual visitation. So this will walk the AST. And what you do with it is you pass it a cursor, like the top level one, usually the translation unit. Uh, you pass it a function, which is further up there, and you pass it some data. So data is just like void star, um, type erased uh, C++ or C polymorphism style. Um, and then the data here includes a filter and the lines. And a filter just, uh, in this case, like it has some, some predicates, right? So you can imagine we have, we have like some code. We want to pass it through some filters and see what if it still matches those. So we, have, we would have a pattern, which is a, like a regular expression. Uh, we, and then some predicates, which are just functions that take a cursor and return true or false. And the, where we actually declare them is inside this function here, so this make filter, uh, which we call at the very beginning, it will check all the options in the global scope, of course, and then add some filters. So for example, uh, if we only want functions, then uh, we would, so we would get the cursor, and we would get the kind of the cursor. So every cursor has a kind, and a kind is, is basically the, the C abstraction for like decal or statement or expression. And then we would check, in this case, if so if, it's, if we want it to be a member, then member function should be a method. So we would check if the kind is CXX method, right? Otherwise, uh, we would check if it's either a function declaration or a method. Then for a variable, we would check if it's, if it's a member, a variable, member variable means field. So we would check if it's a field. Otherwise, check if it's a variable or a field. Uh, parameter checks for parm decals. So all these nodes that you saw before, they are also in Clang. Um, this one here, 
like if you only pass memory, it will look for all functions and fields automatically, so field or, or methods. And for records, it will look for all structs or classes. So these are our filters, and it, uh, what we need to do now is walk through the AST, look at every node, and just ask our filter, does, this, does it match? And this is what the grep function does. So this is the, what we pass to this clang visit children function. And we get a cursor. Uh, this here is the parent, uh, which we don't need in this case. Nope. But uh, we would have that, and this void star client data. So the first thing we do down here then, for example, would be casting that back to our data pointer so we could access our, our stuff. <coughs> Before that, we just check if it's in the system header, because if you write any tool and you forget this, you will, and you include a standard header, you will get loads and loads of different uh, uh, matches for everything, which is very bad, because uh, like, yeah, it's a huge AST. And then, so we would get our data. Uh, data includes a filter. We just ask the filter uh, if the cursor matches. Um, so this would also, this would also check um, one filter, which is the pattern filter. So this uses C++ 11 regexes. Uh, we get the pattern is from the command line. And we would make a regular expression and make it possibly case insensitive, and then just add that as another filter, right? So we, um, and then to actually check it, we would call get cursor spelling. So spelling, again, is, is the, just the name of whatever is our node. So it's the name of the function, name of the class. And then we would just do a regex search and see if it matches. And that will be our, like, one of our filters. So if we, if we go back to rep, we will check if it, if it matches. And if it does match, all we need to do is get, display it. And so here we need those lines that we also have in our data. But what we first need to do is we have a cursor. We want to find out where in the file is this <coughs> cursor. So we call this uh, funky function called clang get spelling location, returns to us line number, column number, and file. And then um, after some assertions, if we have more than one file, we also want to display the file. So if I actually pass the same file twice, uh, we would get the file name there as well. Uh, we would print the file name and then some escape codes. This probably won't work in Windows, um, but we have some escape codes, but then the line number, the column number. And what this here does is, um, yeah, so this one here, it, it, so it gets a line from all the lines in our file, and then it runs through each character, and if we get to the actual <coughs> like, uh, node that we matched, it just throws in those escape codes so that it turns up red and bold. Uh, but essentially, that's all there is to it. And then at the end of grep, where's grep? We call, we return cxchildvisitrecurse. So there's three different things you could return here. This one here tells Clang to continue recursing through the AST. Then there's CX child visit continue, which would tell it to go to a sibling. So for example, if you are at a function and you figure out you're absolutely not interested in any, anything below this function, like the statements inside, you can just continue to the next sibling, which is the next function. Or you could just um, CX child visit break. So just stop at this point and like bottom up again. Yes. Question, yeah. that uh, function where you, you access the current location of your cursor. Yeah. Why doesn't that just return a structure with three elements and have these three... Because it's C. Things? Because it's C. Hmm? Because it's C. Oh, it's the API is C. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, no, like, it, it's, in C, you could return a structure. Yeah, but I think in C, it's customary to have your functions have 20 like parameters. <laughs> <laughs> And, and return a. I was teaching C in the 1980s, and everything more than three parameters is something you should consider. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, also, also like this function here is just, um, way too long, of course. But also, actually, one thing that's like I, I found this like a code a guideline from LLVM quite interesting. If you have lots of parameters, you just put like inline the like Python keyword style arguments. It's actually quite useful. Um, but so anyway, that that's actually I believe all there is to this one here. Um, so we would just print the match, and then if we try this out, so here we are, we have, I, I can like compile this again, it'll just take very long. The reason why it takes long is that, um, wait, it, this was supposed to be more impressive. Um, uh, this, is why, this is why it takes very long to link. Uh, so this is all the LVM libraries you're linking with. Here they're just all in one library, but it's still a huge amount of, of libraries you're linking with, so it takes like, like a minute. We don't have that minute. Uh, so if we now try to use it, so we have test.cpp. And so the point of this tool, right, is that if we just do uh, grep on this and we want to look for all x's, we're going to get like x, all the x's. Like if I had comments that described what x is, I would get the comments back. So what we do instead is we call cpp grep and we say that we only want functions that are called x. 
And so what does it do? So, it, so let's just like walk through it very briefly. It would like go have a function option, so it would add the function filter and the uh, regu regular expression for x. And then here up here in the grep function, we would just have like two filters, which are called inside this filter class. Like, um, so it, it first checks the pattern. If no filters are passed, it just accepts anything that matches the pattern. Otherwise, it checks if any of the filters pass, right? In this case, the, the function filter passes. And if we also wanted to include um, like variables in here, we also get the variables. So this is actually quite cool. Um, I, I don't know, I'm sure like some Visual Studio editors or something do this as well, but for Vim people or other Atom people, this is not uh, there. So this is the first tool. Yes. Uh, so when I actually translate uh, the translation, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have an option for actually include files there at that point? Like include directories for having it search? Yeah. Yeah, you have. So I, I didn't actually do this here, but like this, these command line args. So you would want to fill this out in practice. Mm -hmm. So you would like pass minus e and 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 minus i, sorry, and, and like the directories. Okay. You wanna... But it'll implicitly find the system headers. But if there's any additional headers in this example. It actually won't find the system headers, um, which is which is a problem uh, because so sorry um, the question was uh, can you pass includes? Um, it won't actually find the system headers because so the reason why Clang finds system headers when you compile is because you're using the Clang driver, which like knows everything about your system. But here you're using like, Clang directly, so Clang knows nothing about like C plus plus standard headers are just some headers. Uh, so you would also need to pass those. But um, yeah. But it would know when it is parsing a standard header versus another header versus a translation in itself. That's an option that you can get during the uh, callback. Yes, yeah, so the question was, would it know about the system headers? Um, it does have like this stuff here, so you can check. So like this is like Clang does try to tell you whether or not it's a system header. And you can also even, even check like whether or not a node is from the C++ standard library, like it knows about that as well. Uh, so yeah, you would have to, you would want to check this. There's also like is in main file, which uh, checks if it's in the main file instead of like a system header. But so yeah, uh, that's possible. You could also check a particular node if the two with the enclosing namespaces, and if it's an STD. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's also possible. Okay. So I think the next one was Maccabi. Um, so this here is lib tooling. So it's actually good that we switch to this one uh, as well. Um, so this is the C++ API, which of course is a lot nicer. Um, and the, the cool thing about like lib tooling is that you're not actually like it, there's lots of levels of abstraction that Clang has added on top. So lib tooling is, is developed primarily by uh, Google Munich. Uh, so Chandler's team and, and Chandler's team in Munich um, are using like doing huge efforts to make uh, tooling very easy. Um, so there's already like Clang tooling um, libraries here, and uh, yeah. So let's just try this out. Um, so we would have. So a Clang tool, first of all, is made up of three distinct things. You have an action, you have a consumer, and then you have some kind of uh, callback. So what an action does, first of all, let, let's just like, walk through it. An action uh, allows you to access the AST at, several, at different steps during the compilation. So for example, in this case here, uh, we have an action, and we could override begin source file action, which would be called before every file. So at this point, we could like look at the compiler instance and like get options of the compiler. So in this case, for example, just to show off what it does, um, you could ask the compiler for the language options, which are like, is it C++ 11? It even knows, is it, uh, are we using MSVC uh, like support? Uh, it also knows about garbage collection on or off. It knows about signed overflow. So for example, here, just to like show what you could do, you could access the is signed overflow d defined or not. So there's a command line flag that you could change this. Um, and then you can also access the file name. And then at the end, there's also end source file action. And in between, there is execute action, which we didn't override here, but it does call create AST consumer. And here we're just creating a consumer. And then later on, Clang will just walk the AST um, and with your consumer and call the consumer at various points in the AST. So the next point would be a consumer. So that's like the next step in the pipeline. Um, there is a little bit of boilerplate always associated. And this is actually exactly the boilerplate that Clang tidy got rid of. So if you're writing a Clang tidy check, you're just going to be writing this, uh, like the, the main point here. But here, again, the, the idea of like writing a Clang tool or a lib tooling tool is that you have the main function. So you can do lots more things. You have lots more power. So the next step was the consumer. And the consumer here is using, or it, all it really does, it creates a matcher. 
So what, what lib tooling or, or Clang tooling in general is really, really good at is, is finding a very specific node in the AST. So if you're writing like a style checker, you want to find pointers, Clang gives you lots of possibilities of finding that exact like node in the AST very efficiently and effectively. And for this, Clang actually has uh, a domain specific language under the Clang AST matchers uh, library. Uh, and it has like the, these macros where you can define uh, almost like in, in plain English what you're looking for. So for example, in our case, we're looking for all functions. We want to com compute the complexity of functions. Um, and so we were looking for functions that are in the main file. So this is like in system header, the opposite is in main file. And then we can bind some of these nodes to variables. And later on, we can access them. Then we create a, a match finder, which is part of the library. We add the handler, which is what we have up here, uh, like uh, on top, to the uh, matcher. And then in ha inside handle translation unit, we would just tell Clang to run our handler on the AST. So we, instead of like handle translation unit, there's also a few more points where we can access the AST, like handle like inline function declaration, handle vtable declaration. And the point here is that at this point, the AST is already parsed. So uh, we can access it uh, at several steps. And then the main uh, class is this match handler, which is also part of the ask matches library. And it will be called for every node that matches this expression below that we had for the functions. And inside here, we'll be actually computing the computational complexity. Um, and for this, actually, for this particular tool, I have some more slides. I have one slide. Uh, All right, so what is cyclomatic complexity? Uh, cyclomatic complexity generally computes the number of paths through a program. So if, for example, in this case here, we have a very basic if clause, and this is the control flow graph for this if clause. So we have some start node, and all of these nodes here are basic blocks. So if you don't know what a basic block is, a basic block is any part of your code with exactly one entry point and exactly one exit point. So it's basically any piece of code that has no control through in it. And then if you, if you have a control flow graph, the nodes are the basic blocks, and the edges between the basic blocks are the control flow. So for example, in this case, the first node would be int x equals f, and up to x greater 5, that's the first basic block. Then we have control flow. So we have an if statement, I here the x plus equals 1, or an else branch. And then they both join together back at the return x. And so in this case here, we have two paths from start to end, uh, like the left path or the right path. And now if we added more complexity, like here I just added one if clause, that's what I added, um, then we get another path. So now we have three paths here. Um, and so the cyclic complexity or the Maccabi index for this function would be three. And if it's like, if you add more control flow, it maybe becomes like more than five, more than six. At that point, you maybe like want to try refactoring or like rethinking your control flow. And so one interesting way of, of like thinking about this number here is that if you think of the minimum spanning tree through this graph, so like if you think of some tree that uh, passes through every node, but like with no cycles, so around in this case you would have like this. Can we see my cursor? Yeah. So this path here, and, and this path here. So this like here is one minimum spanning tree. Then all the edges that are not in this minimum spanning tree are additional paths and additional complexity. So like this, if there was only this, the Maccabi index would be one. And for every edge that's not in this minimum spanning tree, the Maccabi index is one, one greater because you have one more path through your program. So then you, you have like this path or this path or this path. And so the way we compute this is actually extremely trivial. Um, so we have this match handler. We get a match result. And the re result contains, most importantly, the nodes that we bound. So, for, so here, for example, we get the result has some nodes. And we can call get node as and access some node that we previously marked, for example, like here we had dot f or just fn. So we can get the fn node. And we can get it as a function declaration. And once we have this function, there's this nice uh, method called build cfg. And this builds a graph consisting of basic blocks. So it's basically just a, a bag of basic blocks uh, in the order that they appear in the control flow. And so we get this control flow graph. And all we need to do now is compute the number of nodes and the number of edges. So th yes? Um, as far as I remember, you could ju just uh, count the uh, number of if statements and while of uh, whatever you have as a condition, the branches, and just add one and you, you're done with my case. Without constructing all the graph structure that we are doing here now. Um, 
that might, sorry, uh, the question was, you could, could you just count the number of ifs and number of while clauses? Um, it's, in, in, yeah, like, I mean, intuitively it sounds simple. I'm, I'm sure, like, if that were the case, you, you would do it. Um, but yeah, it's true that for every branch, you get one extra level, one extra path, and for every while statement, I mean, for while statement, there's a few more nodes because you have, like, you have the condition, then you have the, the loop back. So it's maybe a bit less simple. I think all your switch and other things also might contribute, right? Yeah. I was thinking yeah. the agent. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm sure there's ways around it. There, there is like a, a formula uh, to compute those numbers. It's basically just the number of edges uh, minus the number of nodes plus two times the number of components in the graph. So a component would be like, if you had many, fu many functions, there would be many components of the graph. In this case, it's just like two times one because there's one component. And then we need the number of edges and we need the number of nodes. And that's all we do, we're doing here. Like number of nodes is just the, control, the size of the control flow graph minus two. It's minus two because Clang adds an entry and an exit node at the end and beginning of the uh, CFG. So we just subtract those. And then we just iterate through the basic blocks and, for, and count the out degree, so the outgoing edges for each block. And that gives us the number of edges in the entire graph. And once we have that, we can compute this complexity and then this tool also has like a threshold parameter. We check if the complexity is below this threshold and return if so. And otherwise, we emit a warning, uh, a diagnostic. And, and di diagnostics are actually very cool in Clang. I even wrote a black blog post about it. So diagnostics allows us to use all the power of Clang diagnostics for our own tools. And as we all know, Clang diagnostics are really awesome. They're a lot more awesome than GCC diagnostics, um, especially for templates. Uh, and we have a lot of power here, and it's actually very fun to use it. Yes? A large number of control flows if you've got lots of exception, exceptional routes through your code, which might be an answer to Peter's question. Uh, so the, the question was if you have. Ex exceptions as a, as a possible control uh -huh. flow. Yeah. They don't show up as ifs in there, anything else, and they create a large number of potential control flows if you've got functions taking and returning by value. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine like if you had an exception, that would be like an outgoing edge or would be like an exit node. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, that would most likely, like, that would be an extra level of control flow as well, I, I would suppose. So that would yeah. give you a big number for some very simple looking code. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you can try it out <laughs> yourself then. Um, so what we want to do here is, is demand a diagnostic. And for this, we, let's just see how you do this. So diagnostics, you get a diagnostics engine from Clang. Uh, a diagnostics engine basically gives you access to all the diagnostics power. And then we uh, get a custom ID for iDiagnostic. And this is actually important because Clang has a lot of its own internal uh, warnings that it can, like, has like parameters that it can reuse in certain um, different scenarios. And in our case also, we need a custom ID. We also pass as like severity, so you can have like a note, you can have a warning or error or fatal. In this case, it's just a warning. And then there's like a like formatting like library here as well. So you can say a function with a name is too complex and here we would pass uh, the complexity. And then we get a diagnostics builder from like this report function where we pass the location where it's going to point the caret and the ID. And then we add a string, in this case the qualified name of the function, and we add a tagged val uh, with, a, with a complexity. So th this tagged val function is actually quite, quite funny because it, it takes either a pointer or an integer. So again, as you saw, like LVM is quite loose on the boundary between pointers and integers as long as it's fast. So this function takes either a pointer or an integer, and you need to tell it if it's a pointer or an integer. Um, but essentially, uh, what we get at the end of this is if we go here. So we have some functions, right? So we have like a fun some function f here. It has one path, so Maccabi index should be one. It has a function g that has one unit of control flow. And we have a function f that is way too complex that you'd want to like change, right? So this could be your code. And then we can call Mikabi on this, uh, test CPP. And there's also like a threshold parameter. So if we just set it to zero for a second, um, then in this case, it would, for each function, uh, compute the Mikabi index. If the index is higher than our threshold, it just emits a warning. And here you can see how nice Clang diagnostics are. It, they're like even have colors. So it, we have our message here. The, fun the name of the function is too complex and the index in the parentheses and then also the current pointing at the function. And then what we could do in this case is, usually you would say like uh, sh the threshold should be like five, 
and then only those functions that have that are too complex would actually show up. And if this were your code, you would probably want to think about rewriting your code in this case. And this, this done with the heart here was just to uh, show what you can do at the end of the action. So like you can have an end source file action. At this point, for example, if you're writing a source-to-source -source transformation tool like client format, this would be where you like print out the changed file. OK, um, how much time do we have left? OK, so we can do at least one more, I think. Uh, so we had, what's the next one? Include sorter. OK, uh, so include sorter. I, I didn't actually think people were interested because client format does that anyway. Um, <clears throat> but it's actually cool because um, include sorting means we only deal with the preprocessor. So this shows you how you can access the preprocessor and look at like uh, if, if defs, or in this case, include uh, directives. So we have our boilerplate again, like clang tool. We have some options. And in this case, we have an action and only one preprocess, uh, one consumer. So there's, there's, no, uh, there's not three nodes in this case, there's just one. Um, so we have an action, and we have an option to sort our includes or sort them in reverse order. So we just pass that to the action. And then we have begin invocation. So this I didn't show before, but before begin source file, there's also begin invocation, which is called before any file is even touched. So in this case here, what we do is we get a rewriter. So Clang has this nice rewriter data structure, which is uh, like a, a fancy B tree, which allows you to, like it implements a rope and allows you to rewrite your source code very efficiently. And so we have a rewriter. We tell it the source manager, which manages all the translation units in your code and the language options. And then inside begin source file action, what we're going to do is create our callback. So this is the class above. And then uh, get the, the preprocessor from the compiler and just add a PP callback. And that's really all there is to it. So we add this, this callback. And then uh, what we can do with this callback is enter the preprocessing at various stages. So in this case here, I overrode inclusion directive. But you could also override like if, or override if def. So if you wanted to do some fancier analysis on the preprocessor, you could do that with the PP callbacks. In this case, what we want to do is we want to inclu uh, sort includes. So one thing we have to think about here is that usually, like in this case, or many people like to sort their includes in like blocks. So our, our algorithm here is going to be look at every include directive, look at the line, and if the line number is more than one from like the distance is more than one from the previous line, we have like a block. So sort everything we saw up to there, and then uh, rewrite the source code for that particular block. Um, so here's this include data structure, which just has a file name and tells us whether or not it was like angled, so a library inclusion. And then the actual um, callback here, okay, so it gets the location of the include, gets the inclusion token, which we don't need here, the file name, uh, whether or not it's angled, the range of the entire inclusion directive, uh, the file name, absolute path, real path, and the module, so clang, actually already has like, support for modules. In this case, this was already there before, so it's just a, more of a general idea of a, like, some unit of code. Um, but yeah, so what we have here then is we get the location, which is the location of the hash, and we check if it's in the main file. If not, we just return. Otherwise, we also sort all the standard includes, which is, uh, there's too many. Um, then we use C++17 to get the file ID and the offset of um, the location. The reason we need this is that we later on need to get the line number. And so we can check if the distance is more than one. So we get a file ID, which is just like the identification for the file and the offset from the source manager. So that's what the source manager is good for. And then we call get line number. So this is a bit nicer than you saw before in, in libclang. Uh, we just pass it the file, the offset. Uh, this, this here is, of course, not very idiomatic. But like we also pass it an output parameter to check if there was an error. But anyway, we get a line number. And then here, the idea was that either if we, so if we don't, um, if we already have some includes, and if this line number is greater than the last line number plus one, then we have a block in our include so far. So there's, there's down here we have like this vector of includes. At this point, I just want to like shout out for the data structures inside LLVM. They're really awesome uh, because they actually give you, like as a developer, lots of options and make like conscious decisions about the data structures you use. Um, I think I even have, so like quick digression, I even have this open here. So these are all the data structures you can use inside LLVM. Um, there's a lot more than the nasty ones in, in the standard, especially for hash tables. Uh, but one very common optimization you see in LLVM is using small things. So here you just saw a small vector. 
And the idea is like the small spring optimization for springs. You just allocate a fixed size buffer. And if you need more, then you allocate more space. But for example, you have like small vector, you have tiny pointer vector, which I believe like it either stores, yeah, it has a, it has a pointer and it can either store, like uh, if it's a 64 bit system, you can either store eight bytes, like a container for eight bytes, or it reuses that same pointer to point to an actual data structure. Um, then you have like, uh, well, some like lots of small sets, string sets, dense sets, uh, some index map, B trees. Uh, Twine, Twine is actually very nice. Uh, it allows you to, it builds like a, um, like a, a tree of temporary ex string expressions so that you can like concatenate lots of different strings together and turn them in, into an actual string at the end. I think of an example later. Um, but so let's just go back here. So what we want to do is if we, ha um, so let's just say this is the first include. We get the location of the include, and what we want to do is we want to record the first location and the last location of a block, so that later on when we sort them, we know where to replace the sorted includes. Um, then we emplace back um, the file name and whether or not the include was angled. Uh, we get the last line number and the last location, just so that we can do this more efficiently here. And then, uh, so for the next include, if, this, if the new include had a line number that was more than one away from the last one, for example, if we were, if we just got to this one here, that means that currently in our include vector we have all of these includes, and we want to sort these includes. So to sort the includes, we call sort current, which calls sort includes. And this function here just basically takes the vector of includes. Um, so here is a small vector impl. So if, if you saw Chandler's talk on data structures, you know that LLVM likes to use polymorphism um, to do lots of its small optimization. So for example, the small vector actually derives from small vector impl, which means that you can have this, this uh, small buffer inside the small vector. But when you have a function, you can just take a small vector impl and the whole buffer is actually abstracted away. So this is actually uh, very nice. So we sort our includes, uh, either in rever reverse order or not reverse order. Again, these includes are, are this data structure up here. We sort them and then we just join them all together. And <clears throat> this is basically just, just joining them and, and possibly adding angles. And this here uses this awesome twine data structure. I'm a big fan of this. So what it does actually, it, it's like a recursive data structure. So when you create a twine here, it'll create a temporary twine. And then when you add it, uh, add like uh, this, this const care pointer here, it will create a next, an, a, another twine. And so progressively actually build up a, um, a tree of twines that are all temporary expressions. So if I were to store this, this, this line here, like if I were to like store this, in a variable, it would be complete garbage because all, the, all of these temporary expressions would be deallocated by that point. But what we can do is, um, like, as a temporary expression, build up a tree of twines and at the end just call dot string and have like one big concatenation. So you, you would know exactly what the length of this temporary expression is, build one string, and just throw everything, in, everything into the string. And that's really cool. So we just sort the includes, uh, return the joint lines, and then if we go back to here, um, we have the range from the first location to the last location, and then we just replace the text. So we just <clears throat> get this range, replace it with this text, and that's all there is to it. And, and like clear the include for the next time. And then the only thing that's here is that um, because of the way this is structured, for the last block there won't be an include that's more than one away. So like also at the end of the main file where we can also like jump in, we also want to sort one more time. So let's try it out. Um, are there any questions? No. Okay. I imagine everyone is asleep by now. <laughs> okay. Um, so. <laughs> okay. So what, what's here? So this is actually just uh, the includes from before. Um, you can imagine what what it should do. Hopefully, um, is take these lines and sort them. Um, so include sorter. Uh, oh yeah, so this is exactly what you mentioned before, like what I need to pass some command line parameters. And here, uh, I need to also tell it that it's C++14. And then it works. Okay, so here it actually included, uh, it sorted the includes. You know, one second. Um, and then just to reassure us that it actually works, we can sort them in reverse order. And that works very nicely. Um, and it also sorts them within the blocks, which is cool. Um, uh, some people also told me that it would be nice to Additionally, like sort the blocks. This is also something what you usually want to do. Like, 
uh, sort the include the standard includes at the very bottom, then like more and more specific like client includes, LVM includes, project includes. That could be like the next step. Um, but yeah, so, yeah. Since we're only going through the preprocessor mm -hmm. here, uh, why would you need to include the record? Does actually are you still building the entire translation unit? And could you have actually mm -hmm. um, not had to do that? If you're just like, I just want to preprocess something. Yeah, yeah. Th that's a good question. I. Um, I believe it, it does not like create the entire AST. Nevertheless, one thing Clang is very picky about is actually having like a valid AST. Um, so it, it, I imagine it still actually checks if those includes exist. Probably as part of the like it probably has its own inclusion directive over like base like method which checks if the include exists as part of the preprocessing. Um, but yeah, so one one problem with this Clang is that it actually needs to it actually needs to compile your code like it actually needs to know all the includes and needs to know all the flags to com to compile. So it, it might actually actually also like take a while sometimes if you use a Clang tool. Like if you ever use like include what you use, it sometimes takes half an hour to uh, work on a big project. Yeah. Yeah. The, one of the reasons for that is you know if you're if you're if you're manipulating the AST, well, it needs to know like what. What all the flags are because that yeah. affects the AST. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like if, if it's if you have a dash D, blah 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 blah, and it, so then the if defs come into play. And, you know, yeah, or, or the, like the code. standard as well. For example. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, act, but actually, the thing is that that Clang format does some magic to work around this. So Clang format works without like um, it actually having to compile, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually like if you use Clang format, you also don't have to pass it these includes. So. I'm not sure what it does, but it, it does something nice so that even if your program doesn't compile, it still works. Whereas here, if you have a bug somewhere in your code, it won't work. Um, but yeah, so you have to pass it everything. Okay, yes. So I guess uh, you can bypass the check by uh, adding actions. So it's supporting the driver, the flag driver. Yeah. You can say that, okay, just don't do this action when there is a particular flag is there. And that way you can completely bypass any flag check. Especially for uh, like trivial things like uh, includes, you don't really need to. Uh, if you don't want to uh, have the entire yeah, yeah, I'm sure there, there's ways around it. Um, it's very complicated. Though, yes. Yeah, I mean, one thing that's actually important to know about uh, Clang tooling is that uh, very often what you what you think you would be able to do with Clang tooling is actually modify the AST. But when you use Clang tooling, you will never actually modify the AST. You can't just like make something const or like add a node because Clang has very strong invariants about its AST. It has to be valid. This is actually also one of the reasons why we don't have custom attributes yet because if Clang doesn't know the attribute, then it just like thinks the AST is invalid and it'll just uh, throw it away. So um, this means that whenever you use Clang tooling, all you're going to ever do is change the source code. So for example, in this case, we used a rewriter to rewrite the source code and that's what you can do. Uh, and you can change the source code, but you can't change the AST because that might break something. Uh, there might be lots of invariants in places where you don't expect them. So you can't actually ever change the AST. Although you could change the source and then regenerate another AST. Yeah, I mean, there's also like nothing to stop you from actually like making a node const or something. Like the methods are there, but it just might break stuff. Oh. Yeah, like I mean, the methods are there. Like you can use the source manager to make a node const or something, or you can. Add a new child. So I think that's possible. You might have to like reparse. Um, and I've never done it, but it's, it's definitely not encouraged. Uh, yes. So you, you said that custom attributes are not supported, which is weird because if I wanted to write a tool that, let's say, collects all of the like registrable members of the class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the question is, can you use custom attributes at all or not? Um, yeah. So this is actually true. Um, it's not possible right now. I think it's something people are working on. Um, I actually tried myself to do something once with attributes. Uh, like I wanted to do like a, a memoize. Like in Python, you have this memoize decorator which tells Python to put a, a cache in, in front of every function. And I wanted to do that in um, Clang as well, but it's not possible with an attribute. So the one thing that is possible is that you can actually, like if you have some um, class here, what you can do is that you can use these GCC attributes, like attribute, attribute, uh, I think no, it's it's something it's something different. But like in, uh, if you can use something like that, and you can add a custom like tag. So this annotate is like a GCC extension that Clang supports, where you can pass any kind of string. And then later on, what you can do, and this is how I solve this this memoization problem, is that you can actually look for all nodes that have an, have this annotation, and where this annotation string is this value. 
it's not nice, it, it's especially this like attribute thing, and it's definitely not as nice as an attribute, but it, it is possible, but just not with the C++ 17 attributes yet, uh, but hopefully in the future. Like, I mean, that's definitely, I think, one thing that C++ is lasting, uh, lacking compared to like Java, which has like these, these uh, decorators, Python um, annotations, I think that's something that C++ could really uh, use. <clears throat> okay, are there any questions about include sorting? Otherwise, we have like 15 minutes left. Um, might be a time to just like quickly walk through one more. The next one was <clears throat> pointer finder. Yeah, so pointer finder, let me just think uh, one thing. I, I'm just actually gonna swap, because we don't have much time. I just wanna show you what, uh, how um, fancy the matching can be. I'm gonna do the clang variables. So again, clang variables was the const auto lambdas that have an auto parameter that um, are no except and have a go to inside. And I also want to show you how you can do these, this matching yourself. So let me just go up here. Up. So say you have some code like this here, right? So you have some code and you want to figure out, like you want to make sure that this code has a certain prefix. So what do you do? So the first thing you would do is you do this, this, this ast dump uh, that I showed you before. So a clang ast dump, ast dump f syntax only test.cpp. And right, so this is also why like excluding system headers is often a good idea. But so what we have here <clears throat> is the AST for this particular function, right? So we can see, for example, and this is actually quite interesting, um, what a lambda is, of course, is nothing else than a class, like a, a class that the compiler creates itself. So we have at this point here somewhere a CXX, I think it's actually this one right here. Um, it's, it's uh, this probably yeah I think oh uh, here um, uh, might be uh, but yeah so this is the c6 record decode that's actually declared right so you you can see this AST and now what we're interested in, in is finding out like how do I access this one node that I want so here I can see I'm alumni as a c6 record deco uh, it has because this is has an auto parameter it has the the actual my call operator will be a template. And then it, we, so you have a C6 method decal. This has a compound, state, compound statement, which inside somewhere has an if statement and then a go to statement. And I think somewhere also there is like a no except declared. So the first thing you would want to do is like look at the AST and figure out what nodes you want to look for. And then you can imagine that like Clang tooling people are kind of into tools. So they made a tool to help them write tools. Uh, this tool is called um, Clang Query. And it's actually very useful. <clears throat> so what Clang Query allows us to do is basically like interactively match on the AST. So for example, in this case here, we're looking for um, I think like all of our declarations. Oh, okay. Uh, so let me. Yeah, that's the problem because here I can't actually like scroll up. Yeah. That better. Okay, let's just do this. Yeah. Okay, so you could look like for all variable declarations and it'll look like tell you what there are and then you can ask like what more is there, right? So I want all things that are uh, in the main file and not in the system header. And I want all variable declarations that are, uh, that has a uh, initializer, init list expression, for example, right? Uh, so with this th uh, tool here, you can actually figure out this, this very complex uh, ask matching expression that you need in this case, which is here uh, using this tool. And it's actually very important and without it, it would be very hard. <clears throat> so the boilerplate is the same. The only thing that's interesting here is, is like the, the actual matching. So what we're looking for here is a variable declaration. Um, and the nice thing is that it really like reads like proper English. So you have a, we're looking for a variable declaration that is expanded in the main file that has a type which is const qualified, like the C and the clang that has an initializer, which has a type CXX record deco, which is the, the lambda, uh, that is a lambda, that has a function template deco because it takes an auto parameter, uh, that has a method inside, which is the call operator, which is no accept, and which is a body, which is a compound statement, which has a go-to statement. And then all of this I can bind to the clang name, right? And then up here in my matcher, all I need to do is I get the clang variable, and this would be the same for the pointer finder, by the way. So I just get the node, um, 
and I get the name, and I check if the name is empty because you'd have a variable without a name. And if it's not empty, I want to make sure that it has this prefix. So the pointer finder would be p underscore. In this case, I want it to be clang underscore. And then all I need to do is warn the user about it. And here, also, you'll actually also see fixits. And so clang has this cool thing called fixits, or which actually tells you if you're doing, so doing something wrong, and actually tells you how to fix it. So if the name doesn't start with clang, then we want to emit a diagnostic. So we get the diagnostics engine. We get an ID for our diagnostic. And then we create a fixit. So what a fixit will do is display to the user um, some way of fixing a problem. Right? So in this case here, I want, to make a, I want to make an insertion because I want to tell the user you should actually have a clang underscore before the variable name. So I create an insertion at the point of the variable. Uh, the prefix should be clang underscore. And then I add this fixit hint to the builder. And then if I actually use it, client variables, test.cpp. Uh, oh, I'm not in the Docker anymore. Client variables, test.cpp. And this, nope. OK, right. And so I emit a diagnostic for the variable name. I tell the user to have a prefix clang underscore before this. And then also, like if you add a little bit more effort, you can also add an option to rewrite the source code inline. So clang itself actually has this. So if you have some code, let me actually just like quickly write something. So if no, uh, so if you have like some x and you forget a semicolon, right? So this is actually where clang really shines compared to GCC. Like if I compile this, I don't know if I have GCC on this Docker. Uh, I do. Um, so x.cpp, no, I might not have G++. Anyway, so if I write, do this with Clang, um, <clears throat> then the cool thing about Clang is that it actually tells you the actual problem. So what GCC would do here in this case, it would say that um, at the next line, uh, the first character of the like, next declaration, it would say there's something wrong, like did not expect a declaration here, but Clang actually figures out that you missed a semicolon. And it also uh, shows you how to fix it with this like green underscore. And then um, I believe if I pass xclan fix it, that will do something, <laughs> I hope, x.cpp, and actually fix it, right? So this is really, really cool. So the client already supports this. And if you add a little bit of effort, you can also support this in your own client tools. So this is pretty cool. All right, um, so we have 10 minutes left. I think I'd like to use this just for any questions you have on client tooling or LLVM in general. Yes? Yeah. How rapidly does it change, and how much do you have to usually do to, to port your code to the new system? Yeah, so the question was, like, how rapidly does the lib, the lib tooling API change? It changes to the extent that any tutorial you'll find online is not going to compile. Like, like, everything from a year ago, like, every, like, like Eli Bendersky uh, has lots of cool tutorials on Clang, uh, but nothing compiles. Like, it's all broken because something has changed in the, AS, in the like, AST, some method doesn't work anymore, or something like, this ask matching was only added like in the last two years or something. So anything before that is not going to work or uses like old methods. So very rapidly. Um, yeah. Are there any best practices for handling multiple versions of Clang? Um, I'm not sure if there's best practices. Like I would just say, I, I mean, if you have time, just like always try to keep it up to date with the trunk version. Like in this case here, this is uh, like Clang 4.0, which is already available. Um, and like, if I think it's, it's like like with your normal source code, like if you just stick to some compiler for like half a year, and then because it supports the standard you want, then just it's going to be fine for that compiler because nothing's going to change in the meantime. For for OS compatibility reasons, will you just support three seven three eight M? Do you have any? Yeah, like if you, I mean, if you're lucky, those versions are going to be more or less the same. Um, otherwise, I'm sure you could figure out like. Maybe maybe you have to do some if tests. Uh, otherwise, I'm sure there's a, a standard way around it, um, because I imagine mostly things were added uh, since then. So I, I would hope that it still works. But yeah, it shouldn't be too hard. I think. Yeah. Yes. Any more questions? No. Nope. More questions. Otherwise, I do have one, a few outro slides. Uh, one is about Clang D. Um, so Clang D is a very new project. Like like that I just. Uh, heard of straight from LVM conference a few months ago or a few weeks ago. Um, Clang D is going to be a language server. So this is actually very cool. It's going to be an editor agnostic background daemon that runs on your system. And that 
different editors like Eclipse or Atom or Xcode or um, Visual Studio or whatever you use can actually communicate with. And this is actually very important because um, what uh, Clang D will allow you to do is like make, I don't know, RPC calls or, or something like that or communicate over a socket and get code completion, get indexing, get linting, get formatting, like basically get Clang as a service uh, on your system. And that's going to be pretty big. Uh, at the same time, it's, it's like, I mean, it's, I was, I was going to say it's nowhere near, near stable. They actually already have quite a few things. Like they have code completion, they have linting. Right now they're figuring out the indexing strategy. Um, one second, but yeah, so it's, it's still a work in progress. And if, you, if you're interested in just talk to me and I'll point you in directions, yes. Is it, <coughs> what kind of APIs that you can introduce in the API that uh, Microsoft? Yeah, the Microsoft, yeah, the Microsoft server, language server protocols. It's, it's an implementation of that, yeah. Yeah, okay. So it's, it's very early development. Like there's just one or two guys working on it, but it's, it's very promising. Um, so, and so if you want to help out, uh, please do. And then also like, how do I continue? So this, this talk was not necessarily about me being an expert, but me just like sharing, sharing the learning experience. I also want to like point you in some directions. Uh, one point is, is Eli Berndersky's blog. So this is a, a Googler working on the TensorFlow team, actually, he works on this, this compiler using LLVM that compiles the computational graphs for TensorFlow. But he also has loads of posts on Clang and LLVM, uh, which are very interesting. Um, then, like I would say, LLVM and Clang internals. So there's actually, even though the inline source documentation is not too extensive, there's lots of resources externally. Like, so before you saw this, this programmer's manual, like there's just like a whole document on everything about learning how to use LLVM. There's the same thing for Clang. There's the same thing for like ass matching. So just like use those resources. Then there's this blog by a person uh, that may be me um, that has some blog posts on Clang. I'm also going to put all these other tools that I have here uh, up online so you can use them and just like pull the Docker. It should take like three minutes and then you can try out all these different tools. Um, they're all documented so you can see what they do and maybe take it from there for your own tools. And then the source code. So as you saw, I'm very excited about the Clang source code. It's very, very nice code. Uh, it uses very, like the people working on it are extremely smart and extremely performance par paranoid. Um, so like it's very educational to look at the code and see how they do it. Um, and maybe also fix all the things they, they did wrong. Um, but yeah, so and the, the slides are gonna be up there um, later on, <coughs> including the code and, and the server. If you wanna like look at my server, you can also look at the server. Okay, thanks. Uh, so this is gonna be Q&A, but I think we can skip that. Um, so yeah, thanks.